All right then. So I will give a very warm welcome on behalf of the Institute of Cornish Studies here at the University of Exeter. Uh, my name is Matt Valler and I'm convening this series, uh, Complex Cornwall Theoretical and Practical Innovations in Interdisciplinary Research. And this is seminar two and we're very glad to have Professor Jane Wills with us. I'll introduce you in just a moment. Um, just to say hi to all the people who are joining us on Teams. Uh, and thank you to all the people who've made it here. We may have some people turn up um, in a moment, but uh, we'll get underway now. Um, so our, our topic today is complexity and pragmatism in sustainability research. Uh, and it's a fascinating topic, so I'm really looking forward to this. In our last seminar in January, we looked at uh, complexity and realism in uh, social science research. Uh, and um, the video of that is available and after this seminar we're taking a video from this, the video from that and starting to curate these seminars in a series so that we can have some conversation ongoing in the meantime. Um, the third seminar in this series will be not until October, the 4th of October, uh, when we've got uh, Professor Stefan Boom um, talking on uh, complexity and evaluation in organisational practice, which will also be fascinating. But the whole idea of this series is to give us a chance to look at how do we deal with complexity when research challenges are often becoming more and more complex. How do we deal with complexity as an analytical tool in a way that actually works for us um, and that can actually help develop research that becomes useful, insightful, and takes us further than we've been before. Um, now, I can hear a tiny bit of noise coming out of the speaker in here, so that means someone online needs to mute their speaker, uh, sorry, mute their microphone. Um, if you could all make sure you do that, that would be great. Um, just a little bit of audio housekeeping, because um, we've made this a hybrid event, and the last time it seemed to work pretty well. Um, what we need to do in here is make sure we don't uh, talk over each other, it's not a huge chance, not loads of people in the room, uh, but it just it does cancel out the audio for people online. So we just have to be really careful of that. Uh, and if you are online, if you can make sure you mute your microphone, then you're not disturbing anyone else. Um, what I might do, actually, Jane, is if we could just exit this, we can mute the speakers in here until afterwards. And then if we want to bring people back in, um, then we can do that. So if I just bring that down, there we go. And then. Yeah. OK, OK. Um, so uh, without further ado, I shall introduce Professor Jane Wills. Uh, you're the uh, director of the Environment and Sustainability Institute here at the University of Exeter and a professor of geography. Uh, and you've been involved in the Institute of Cornish Studies. Um, and we're really grateful uh, to have you with us. You published extensively on pragmatism, which is the thing you're going to talk to us about. Um, so over to you. Thanks, Matt, and thanks all for coming. Um, because we've got such low numbers, it'd be very nice to just introduce everybody, name and how you've ended up here, where, you know, where you're placed, just so we know who we're talking to. It'd be much more fun. Um, so obviously you've just heard who I am, so maybe if we go around this way and just say who you are and any affiliation if you've got one. Yeah, no, no I do. I have, I have two hats. So my name's Rebecca Edgeley. I'm the director of the Learning and Teaching in Higher Education programme at Exeter, but I'm also just started as a postgraduate researcher on the Renewal Project, ah. so the Biodiversity Renewal Project within sociology, but looking at collaborations in practice. So complexity, yeah, all of that. I'm just great. Yeah, this sounded great. <laughs> yeah, so you're based at the ESI? Um, I, so technically I'm based at Streatham within sociology, but because I work and live here, and of course a lot of renewal colleagues are here, and my theme cuts across all of it, I'm here. Does that make yeah, sense? Definitely. <laughs> you should make sure you're properly affiliated with the ESI community, so we'll talk afterwards, yeah. And it was Rebecca. Rebecca. Actually, mine, I guess. I'm, I'm Peter. I'm, the, uh, I'm in the second year of uh, undergraduate renewable energy engineering here at Richard yeah. And hence I'm on the campus, and I'm interested in Cornish language and culture from a heritage point of view. And I got this email about the ICS, and here I am. Great. And your name, Peter. 
Thank you. Thank you. And you too. Rachel. I'm Rachel Turner. I'm in ESI and, and a marine social scientist slash geographer. Oh, you've just arrived. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I snuck in uh, and uh, yeah, I'm also an ESI uh, lecturer in environmental social sciences. I'm Ona. I sit in the business school here, but I'm also affiliated since yesterday with ESI. Um, and I work, I'm a lecturer in sustainable business and politics. Um, so I'm mainly interested in this uh, topic from a political perspective um, and how that intercuts with their interaction with the corporations. We're going to have a nice discussion, I can see. This is going to be good. Uh, Paul Simmons, uh, PGR with the Institute of Cornish Studies uh, on the role of the footpaths within and uh, yes, within yeah. uh, climate and cultural emergency uh, to, to transition to a sustainable, you know, to, sorry, to transition to low carbon economy. So I'm um, interested in many interdisciplinary uh, ideas. And Matt didn't say, but he's a PhD student. That's right, yes, at um, Queen's University Belfast, but I live in Truro, so. And I don't know if anyone online is still with us, but yep. we will. when we get to questions, maybe everyone could say who they are mm. there as well, so we don't miss them out. Sure, I've got a few people just actually putting some intros in. I could quickly okay. read those, yes. Okay, so yeah. We've got uh, Sean, uh, who's uh, a Master's in Green Economics at Bournemouth University and is working with the Cornwall Marine Network uh, okay. as the Business Sustainability Executive. Um, uh, and then we've got um, Matthew Thompson, who was here at the last seminar, who described himself as a local activist and social entrepreneur. Um, uh, and there was also a comment, if we're speaking in the room, could we speak up slightly, just so that the microphone okay. here can, can pick us up. We've got a few other people typing intros, but maybe we'll read those yeah. out a bit later. Okay, so um, complex Cornwall, I was asked to talk about complexity, which is, I know there is a thing called complexity theory, um, but I decided I wasn't really going to talk about that. I'm really going to talk about epistemology. So our kind of approach to knowledge, how do we know what we know? And I'm just, just going to dump some ideas on you, reflecting on experience of research in Cornwall and then see what you think. Uh, my dad was a very proud Cornishman, Methodist minister, and when he was developing his best sermons, he used to bring what were called visual aids. So I've brought three, which I will pass around at suitable moments to keep you all awake. Uh, one is The Power of Pragmatism, which is a book which I can kind of promote and flog to you now, uh, but I'll pass that around. And then I've got some Newling Copper and a Serpentine Lighthouse. So if nothing else, you've got to stay with me so you get to those exciting bits. Um, uh, and I'll just bang through it and then hopefully we can have a discussion. So by epistemology, what I'm really thinking about is the who, where and what of knowledge, which I've called the three W's. I'm going to say a bit about that. And then that's linked to a wider debate about participation, place-based research and problem-based learning, the three P's. Um, and it raises another big P for me, which is pragmatism. And pragmatism is a way, I think, to avoid the charge that always comes back to you when you do anything place-based, which is parochialism or peripherality, politicisation, that you're in a kind of camp or it's pointless because it's not talking about the big picture. So I'm going to try and show you, really, the talk is about why pragmatism is a useful resource for dealing with some of these challenges in social science epistemology, um, particularly maybe in the face of the biggest P of all, which is progress. And it seems to me that our kind of commitment to big P progress is one of the things that human beings keep doing and it keeps causing endless amounts of trouble for us. And the way what sustainability is about is trying to deal with the outcome of our commitment to progress with a big capital P. But Matt asked me to have a provocation to get us all going at the beginning. So here's my provocation to think about while I'm burbling on uh, for the debate, perhaps. So I'm thinking about campus social science. So if, if we think about these questions of epistemology and then apply it to the social science community on our campus, what might that do? Uh, what could we really think about with that? And then I was looking at at what campus social science we have. There's about 25 full-time equivalent staff here, um, which is quite a reasonable number of people across um, our department, which is the Department of Earth and Environmental Science. So people like Rachel, Tom and I are in geography and environmental social science. 
Then there's a group in business, which is honours uh, group. Uh, and then there's a group in HASS, that, um, arts and social, no, humanities, humanities and social arts science. and social sciences on Penryn campus, which is the main group, politics, law and history, where the ICS sits. And then we've got another group in the European Centre for Environment and Human Health who are also moving to the campus. And there's quite a large group of social scientists there. So if we thought about our research differently, we would maybe amalgamate all those 25 people and think about the kinds of research we were doing. Um, and that might make a big difference to the kind of social science we were doing and were able to do. In addition, we have the Institute for Cornish Studies, obviously, which is a bigger network of people organised around some social science questions in those four headings, culture and heritage, politics and government, society, economy, environment and health. And then in addition, there's been long talked of a civic university agreement uh, for Cornwall and the Arts of City, which is about our university, Falmouth University, working with key stakeholders in the region. Long talked about, still not really delivered. Uh, but again, that might be another vehicle for doing the kinds of pragmatist research that I'm going to try and sell to you uh, in the rest of this. So I'll, I'll keep going. Um, I was thinking that that's, that social science community on campus is complexity incarnate. It's really not the way to organise things if you wanted to be strategic about the social science capacity. We're all in different uh, bits of the university. We're all free agents. We can do whatever we want when it comes to research within limits. Um, we're in, we've got certain incentives to do what we do, income, pe publishing, perishing. Um, and there's no collective steer really about what we, we should be doing with that capacity. So I think that's something to maybe think about for the discussion later on. If you were to mobilise those 25 people around a shared vision or a shared approach or a shared epistemology, a strategy, and you wanted to do place-based research in a really systematic way, what could we do with those 25 people? Um, and what would it mean for the civic university agreement, the ICS, and our, our kind of local regional capacity? Uh, and if we talk about these things, like the civic university agreement, the Institute for Cornish Studies, is it just hot air or is there something we could actually uh, do in a more meaningful way with it? So back to the three W's then, these debates about epistemology. Um, really, it's about who are we working with, so where, who are we doing our knowledge production with, where are we situating it uh, and what are we trying to achieve and in some ways what's been happening over the last 50 years it seems to me across all the social sciences is this slow process of democratization so shifting who's in the who question localizing it uh, or grounding it lots of debate about situated knowledge so localizing it in some ways and purpose orientating it so making it much more around problem oriented research uh, so I'll just whiz through that really quickly. In terms of the who then, there's been a real shift. This is probably the area where there's been the most work done in terms of who's engaging in this research. So a big push on participatory action research, PAR up there, um, and long-standing debates about where does where's knowledge coming from? What's it from? So Donna Haraway most famously talking about the God trick that we can't sit outside and look down on, on the world as a god would. We're always embodied in our place and our people. Uh, we're always in, in particular cultures, so we're always having conversations with particular people. Um, so recognising that and embracing a, more of a, a, an approach to grounded knowledge and participatory action research. Um, and that comes then on a scale of measures from consultation at one, one end through citizen science to emphasis on co-production. So lots of debate in science science around citizen science and you kind of go from the kind of milder end citizens of census through to participatory science through to much more uh, what they're calling extreme citizen science but meaning that the, the, the citizen actually has a role in setting the research questions on the agenda as well. So there's a big debate being going on in social science for a long time now around the who. Likewise, there's one about the where. So situated knowledge has become um, much more widely adopted. And when you start to situate things, that means place, really. Uh, you're grounding that knowledge in a particular geographic location, sometimes in a particular interest group, but it's about geographical um, placement often. 
that you can't just assume that things are going to happen the same everywhere, that you have to kind of ground your, your research and your knowledge. Uh, and that's been a massive debate in geography, particularly led by people like Doreen Massey uh, for the last 30 plus, really back to the 1970s. And she's written a whole series of books. This is was the, one of the later ones called Four Space, which I think Matt's still got my coffee a bit. Um, talking about the importance of place and geography mattering. And we can't just assume that um, we do this disembodied uh, research anymore. And then the final thing is about the third W, the what. So a lot more research is now um, explicitly around problem solving, problem based knowledge, um, that this is about kind of needing to know, grounding knowledge in the big questions of the community and trying to find out things that people actually want to know. And in some ways, I was thinking this is the W that's had slowest change over that period of time. Um, because if you look at the journal papers and so on, most of the provocations or the questions of research are driven by what other academics are thinking about, what's the kind of trendy latest idea. Uh, it's less grounded in place. And this is where pragmatism really comes in, as I want to try and sell to you in a second. Um, so these kind of questions about epistemology, why we're, what kind of theories of knowledge we've got and what we're doing and why we think we're doing what we're doing are really evident now in UKRI. So UKRI is UK Research and Innovation. They're the power brokers for most of the research funding in the UK. They've really shifted rhetoric, at least, around these kinds of questions. So this is just some headlines from recent work that they've been funding. They've got a public engagement strategy. Uh, and as listed there, it's got three main bullet points. Um, shared endeavour by making research and innovation relevant and accessible to all. So that's about engaging people. Making sure the benefits of research and innovation are shared widely by supporting collaboration and diverse knowledge, sharing gains, and then creating opportunities for all by inspiring and engaging the next generation, realising change. Uh, so just recently, a couple of calls that have been prominent are the local policy innovation partnerships, um, which I don't think they've announced who's got those yet, but therefore regionally orientated networks of researchers to work with community groups to set research agendas on a spatial geographical scale, but certainly the regional scale, local stroke regional. Likewise, community research networks have been funded recently, and that's really about the community getting the money to set its own agenda. Um, so the Rs of Silly have got one of these, for instance, which we're working with for our student projects on field trips this year to kind of explore whether the community thinks it's got a research agenda, how it would decide what that research agenda is, what kind of relationship they need with higher education institutions to develop that agenda and deliver on it. So that is a significant shift in many ways for UKRI to give money to the community to determine its own agenda and then to decide how to work with universities. And there's going to be around two of that for the ones that are really up and running to hopefully secure extra money to then do something. And we're talking with people over there now to see if we could be the key research partner for that so that we would be the university that they could work with. Um, so before that, there's been programmes on enhancing place-based partnerships in public engagement, which is another research agenda set up by UKRI. I think there are 25 projects across the country. It's lots of citizen science stuff they've done to an AHR that had a connected communities programme. So there is something going on, a kind of cultural shift in thinking about research, which is reflected in UKRI, which really is about those three W's. It's really a shift in our epistemology. And it'd be good to see what everybody thinks. But in a way, it's kind of happened under the carpet. Um, it's sort of in the ether, in the culture, but we've not really talked about it as a collective together. Um, so this is a question as has, I've put this up because has Susan Songtang, everything has changed and nothing has changed. Because in many ways, if that was really the way we were doing research, that feels like quite a profound shift in how we would approach the work we're doing. And yet nothing really has changed. So if you look at the REF, the research assessment exercises, they're still, they seem very old fashioned and unable to reflect that agenda. And it's, that's quite striking to me. It's all about, you know, numbers of research active people, how many papers, how many grants, how many PhD students, it's numbers, 
it's citations. It's not really about grounded place-based research, working in with partnership with different communities, transforming the way we think about knowledge production. So there's a kind of mismatch here, uh, and it'd be really good to hear what you think about this whole business. And in many ways, I think that there's kind of lots of lip service paid to these three W's. And in many ways, we still get under that. It's not so articulated, but the four P's I've put there are really what a lot of people think. That anything you do that's place based and regional or local or uh, partnership oriented with small community groups, say, is kind of parochial, doesn't really matter. It's bound to be peripheral to the big science or the big questions. It's probably politicised because you're going to get into bed with X or Y and it's not real knowledge and it's probably a bit pointless. And really what we should be doing is the big guns and going for the big global massive grants, you know, super science. So there seems to be a real um, Janus face, I suppose, going on in the, U in the UK research community and in universities about what we're actually being asked to do and what is being prioritised. And they seem to be two very different things. And I'm kind of struck all the time by pragmatism as a political philosophy, which was grappling with some of these questions 100 years ago, that has quite a lot to tell us about ways we might get out of this three W's versus four P's kind of mess. And the other thing actually is progress, the biggest P. Um, when we think about sustainability, now I'm going to get to sustainability just a tiny bit, um, we're often caught in this thing about progress because human beings have a terrible history of having some problems and then thinking progress comes with creating some new solutions, which then 10, 20 years ago, later have created another load of problems. And we're totally sold on this idea that we're going to be making progress and being a progressive is a really good thing. But what we end up doing is creating another load of mess and we keep creating more problems that we then have to solve in, in future generations. And I think sustainability actually should be trying to rethink this obsession with progress. And pragmatism, I think, might be able to help us do that. I'm not sure exactly how, but I'm hoping this conversation will help. Uh, because I'm struck by that a lot now because the government is getting serious about net zero and net zero seems to be a way of doing new engineering technological things which are going to create another load of massive headaches. We've got to extract massive amounts of stuff out of the ground. We've got to put chemicals into oceans because we want to sink carbon. We haven't got a clue what we're doing. We're going to create another load of problems. Uh, and really, as a sustain social science sustainability community in the ESI and the campus, we should be maybe rethinking that whole paradigm. And, and pragmatism might help us do that. So just briefly then, the philosophy of pragmatism. And here's my first visual aid. I'm going to pass around this book, which came out of a, a conference we organised a few years ago before I was when I was working in London, just before I left. We tried to get people to, together to think about the, the historical tradition of, of pragmatism as a philosophical tradition, the resources it gave us, and then how we might apply it to different areas of social science. So we've got a chapter on development studies, a couple on sustainability, things about history, things about the key ideas. Uh, and it's quite a nice book, which I can shamelessly promote by... Uh, yeah. Passing round because and, it's a, it just came out in paperback, right? Oh yeah, it did. Yeah, I spotted. Yeah. So it's even cheap. you can actually afford it now. Exactly. <laughs> you can afford it. It's about twenty-five quid. But you need to get some copies in the library. So on this slide, which has got too many words on it, I've tried to just put the headlines of what we're talking about. Um, pragmatism is a philosophy that really came to its own in the in the eighteen nineties, early twentieth century, uh, in the US after their civil war. <laughs> so after the American Civil War, um, there was a real sense in which people, had, well, people had literally been killing each other. So it's not unlike today. There's different camps of people and they are in totally different worlds, totally different conversations, totally different universes. You know, you're either a Trump supporter or you're not. You're a Brexiteer or you're not. You're a vaccine supporter or you're an anti-vaxxer. Everybody's in their, their trench warfare. Uh, and very similar stuff was going on in America in the 1890s after the Civil War. 
And in that sense, they were actually killing each other. So we haven't got to that yet, but there was a kind of sense of division and pragmatism was a philosophical response uh, to that in many ways. And the key, some of the key thinkers were, um, philosoph there was a philosophical argument really with William James, who's the brother of Henry James, wrote some really amazing, exciting books, which are having a bit of renaissance in bits of academia at the moment. John Dewey, probably the best known uh, to many people here, big champion of democracy and theories of democracy. And then a guy called Peirce, who was the forerunner of this and was much more philosophical um, and not really recognised in his time properly. But anyway, then there was a resurgence in the 1980s, 70s and 80s, with a, a later group of pragmatism, really led by Richard Rorty, if any of you have read his work. Pretty, really creative uh, philosopher, very engaged in public life, uh, and associated with people like Richard Bernstein and Robert Brandon. There was a bit of a research. This is particularly in America. It never really came over here very much. But one of their great insights is that ideas are tools for action. So it's quite utilitarian, quite practical, quite grounded. And it's basically saying that social human beings are social animals and that we have various belief systems that help us make sense of the world around us. And when we get to a fork in the road or a problematic situation, as Dewey called it, we need to then decide what to do. Most of the time, we're just sort of bubbling along like any other organism. But when we get to something problematic, we have to decide what to do. And that's where our tools come into play. So our ideas are our key tool to decide how to, to deal with a problematic situation. Um, and so we're not really starting with the abstraction or metaphysics, which was the philosophical tradition before this. We're starting with the practical. It was very much about grounding ideas in their practice. And thinking about um, William James was really famous for his pamphlet on pragmatism, which came out just before the turn of the century, early 20th century, um, where he was saying, so what's the, what difference does an let's judge ideas in relation to what difference they make to the world. Rather than deciding what's truth in some sort of abstract sense, let's ground ideas in their outcomes. The cash value he talked about, so it has got that utilitarian uh, history to it. Uh, and it also, though, means that we have this place-based underpinning because the human culture is always geographically differentiated. So human cultures have de developed and people have ideas that help them make sense of those particularities. Um, but in that particularity, there's also pluralism. So, so it, this tradition's got a massive commitment to plur pluralism. So where we've got the fights going on in the trench warfare between different communities, the argument is, uh, so let's take in, take stock of the range of opinion and see what's the cash value of those different ideas for those different, why have people got those ideas and where have we got the problem that we can come together around. So this is where you get this sense of the fork in the road, the problematic situation in Dewey's writing, the need for some more practical outcomes. And this is where the big idea for social science research is, which is social inquiry. So when you're confronted with these problematic situations, you have a social inquiry, you have a, a process of inquiry to gather the range of opinion and decide what to do about it. And in Rorty's reading of pragmatism, this is where you tell new stories. Um, so narrative becomes incredibly important in Rorty's work. And he basically says philosophers should forget they're philosophizing, they should be thinking about stories and narrative and novels and what kind of stories we tell to make change in the world. Um, resisting this kind of sense that we've got some abstract truth um, and we need to ground our truths and make them do work for us uh, in the world. So it's very much about challenging some versions of uh, philosophy and research. So this is the kind of model of this, um, when there's a problematic situation, a community of people will get together explore different ideas, think about the application of those ideas, and then tell stories about those ideas to make the world in a different way. So it's about the world being very contingent and open to remakings. Um, and Dewey, at the time, lots of these people were talking about the difference between physical sciences and social sciences and arguing that the social sciences is very much about this community discussion around the ideas that might do work for us and experimenting what works, what doesn't work. We sometimes don't know that in advance. We have to experiment, action research, find out what works, 
and then change the way we think about things. Um, so here's a provocation for this debate that I tried to set up at the beginning from John Dewey writing in uh, 1938. Uh, to set up a problem that doesn't grow out of an actual situation is to start on the course of dead work. And lots of our academic scholarship is really dead work. I think when you look at the journals, it's full of stuff that we really don't need. It's not helping us do very much at all. Problems that are self-set are mere excuses for seeming to do something intellectual Something that has a semblance or, or, but not the substance of scientific activity. And what he was arguing all the time is that we need to bridge this gap between different communities of knowledge in a society. So he's saying here, it's impossible for the highbrows to, because when he was writing The Public and Its Problems, which is one of his most famous books, it was a time in which society was becoming bureaucratized and the state was growing and the ex notion of expertise was really taking off. So you have this kind of gap, which is even more severe now between a technocracy, a technocrats who kind of know the answers and the Joe publics. Um, and the kind of gap between the two is big in Dewey's day, but it's even bigger now. And he's saying there it's impossible for the highbrows to secure a monopoly of knowledge uh, in common affairs. And in, in the degree to which they become a specialized class, they're shut off from knowledge of the needs that which they're supposed to serve. Um, and so pragmatism was a an attempt to try and bridge those kinds of gaps between the, the civil service, say, the technocratic elite, the people in universities, uh, and the people on the ground in, in communities. And that's where Rorty spent a lot of his time and energy trying to re-engage people. Um, he wrote some brilliant stuff around predicting, really, the rise of Trump because of the class divide that grew between, you know, the working people who are constantly being immiserated in parts of America uh, and a kind of a, a ruling class so that that stuff around populism really started to stick and he was miles ahead, miles ahead of that. So I'm going to make this much more concrete now before we get to discussion. So if we're going to ground our research in place and community, the place where we do that really makes a difference. So everyone in the ICS knows this because Cornwall is special. Cornwall has a very obvious uh, special history uh, going way back over um, a thousand years, Cornwall was isolated. It wasn't really part of the English state at all. It had a very different culture. It looked west. It was a Celtic nation. Um, even in the 14, 1500s, Cornwall was talked about as a separate nation like Wales. Um, and it did have that very slow integration to the English and British state, which made it, it have its culture for much longer. Uh, so there's a need to kind of recognise where we are, be grounded in our place and our culture. And then what I'm going to pitch to you is the way that we maybe should set our research questions or our epistemology around having conversations with the community in our place. And I just want to show you a couple of ways in which I've tried to, to do that um, over the last few uh, years, three years maybe. So conversation one was a bit of research that came about by having conversations with town councils, town and parish councils in Cornwall. The conversation started because of Locality, which is a national um, charity. So it runs loads of community centres up and down the country, sort of place-based community interventions, community development trusts, things like that. They had something called the Future of Localism, which why I was part of a commission on the Future of Localism. Um, uh, and we were looking at the way in which local authorities and other players could develop localist culture to em empower local communities with more control over their local assets, their public realm and so on. At the same time, austerity was meaning loads of local assets were being sold off. So if you remember a few years back, uh, public libraries were being shut, swimming pools were being shut, hundreds of public assets were going uh, on, on a kind of monthly basis and they wrote a couple of reports about this and when I moved to Cornwall um, I brought some of that work with us and we did it, one of our case studies for the National Co Commission was on what was going on in Cornwall because Cornwall was doing something really different to what was going on in the rest of the country and no one was really picking up on it. Um, there's been a massive um, transfer of assets from Cornwall Council to parish councils 
And because we had that geographical legacy of town and parish council structures, political structures in Cornwall, which most parts of the country had lost with the Industrial Revolution, so most cities had lost that very local um, scale of government, assets were just being sold, there was no one to pass them on to. Whereas in Cornwall, because of the parish and town council structure, things like parks, um, swimming pools more recently, and Matthew's online, and he will probably talk about Pendennis Leisure and what's happening in Falmouth, but Falmouth Town Council has been at the front of this, taking over management of parks, libraries, swimming pools, burial grounds, benches, public toilets, really important elements of the public realm, community life, which are now run in Cornwall by, by parishes, rates have often had to go up to pay for them. Whereas in other parts of the country, they've largely been sold off or downgraded. So there's something really special about our geography and our institutions, which, which was not really recognised nationally. And I was involved in doing a piece of research about that, talking about it and trying to write it up. Um, there's probably a lot more work to be done about it, but it shows you where place-based research is a provocation to then ask different questions. I think that's the point uh, I'm trying to make with that one. Conversation two is something that's been led really by Rachel, who's here, so this is good. Uh, we can discuss it later on. A conversation that's been ongoing now for a few years around Cornwall Council's efforts to use donor economics to think about how we respond to sustainability challenges in a more integrated way. So we look at the ecology and in theory anyway, and the social and try to do things together. Um, council adopted what's called a decision making wheel. And Rachel led a first round of research looking at what is the state of the donor, donor economics in Cornwall. So lots of information around um, all these donor economics challenges and what the state of play is in Cornwall and then thinking about how this allows you to see new things or do new things so it's very pragmatic in that sense it's saying you've got a problem sustainability is a problem we need to find out how to do things better and differently donor economics was an experiment to see if that helps people see things differently and therefore act in different ways and we made an argument that this is a way to downscale some of the big uh, discussions around sustainability because a lot of it happens at the global level it's all about the SDGs and what the UN wants us to do and it it doesn't speak to people on the local scale and this was an effort by local stakeholders to make something speak and we were able to do some research to have a conversation with them about that and then that led actually I've got my here's my serpentine lighthouse this is about light uh light being shone um this is a family heirloom of mine, which I'm very attached to, Serpentine Lighthouse from the Lizard. But the second stage of that conversation with the council was about how do you democratise goal-based governance? So if you're going to have this vision, if you're going to have a vision about goal-based governance, like UN type thing, if you're going to localise it, how do you then democratise it? How do you widen the conversation? So we organised something called the Civic Lantern uh, with a brilliant facilitator called Katie Kirk. And we tried, to, we also discussed with councillors and people in the leadership board um, around how we would do di decision making differently. So again, it's a very practical process where you're getting people in the room to have a conversation, lots of convening conversations, deciding how to do things differently. They agreed to support this initiative or experiment called the Civic Lantern, which was an action research project to try and get civil society and civic society into the room together to say, OK, if we were going to promote one goal for the year, what would that goal be? Uh, so it's very much a, a kind of experimental process. And we came up, well, we came up with two goals. This one, Sustainable Community Growth Scheme, was the top one. And we've been making a bit of progress around that to try and support communities in Cornwall who want to set up a sustainable growing scheme, a kind of community agriculture project to do so. So I mean, we're now in discussions around how to match people who've got land with people who've got community building capacity to make it happen across communities. The other one was on prop housing and housing shortages, much less successful, nothing's really happened. But we've treated it as an experiment in a, in a pragmatic way to say, you know, what works, what doesn't work. And then we've been writing it up. Uh, we've been trying, hopefully, to get it published. 
And then just briefly, conversation three uh, is another conversation that's kind of taking off, which is around nature recovery. Cornwall has been pioneering nature recovery strategies, whereby you again bring civil society, landowners, businesses together to try and find ways of working on nature recovery, identifying land resources, funding, to renew biodiversity, so it's very connected to the Renew project. Um, and then thinking about that as a development strategy for regional development. And Cornwall Council has this thing called Britain's Leading Edge. I don't know if anyone's looked at it. It's an initiative to build a coalition of local authorities in the rural periphery. And the argument is that all the government funding and national attention goes on this policy corridor down the middle of the country, and the rural periphery gets missed off. Whereas in the brave new world of a, a green future, the rural periphery is becoming much more important for farming, agriculture, nature recovery, renewable energy, marine ecosystems. Um, but we can't really do much if every bit of this is treated as a separate agent. Um, so the idea is that by pulling up at the moment, there's 11 local authorities in those green spots around the edge that belong to the coalition, and then to talk with one voice to government around the interests of the rural periphery. Um, and we've been working on a PhD project to experiment with how you might turn nature recovery into a regional development policy uh, around the levelling up agenda and so on, and taking that to government uh, in the interest of the rural periphery. So I suppose my point is that if we take this approach to epistemology, we embed ourselves in a place in a community and then we start to have conversations with different communities around their problematic situations and what kind of ideas work. And we can only really do that by experimenting, by creatively coming up with ideas, testing them out and seeing what works and then seeing what travels, what new stories we can tell about them. So if we started to apply that approach to our social science capacity on this campus, we might actually be able to do something a bit more systematic and serious about transforming Cornwall. So rather than filling up journals with papers that no one really wants to read, to have conversations with people in Timbuktu, we might be able to think about what we're doing to transform our own neighbourhood, our own patch of the planet. And when you start to think about the kinds of conversations that are already happening, but we could really invest in a bit more, there's a huge proliferation of conversations. So nature positive farming, I've mentioned, methane capture, we're at Cornwall is pioneering loads of exciting stuff anyway. It's a matter of just kind of joining the conversation. So there's a company called Benjamin that's trying to trap methane that comes out of slurry pits on livestock farms, trap it, process it, use it for fuel. You're stopping the carbon emissions and you're using a green technology. Uh, that's a really interesting area we should be talking more about. The devolution <clears throat> arrangements are going on, critical minerals, mining, that's really rising up the agenda. Offshore wind is coming to hit us and the community is not really prepared for what that might look like and who's going to get the jobs, who's going to get the benefits. Um, massive bit of work to do there. Planetary Technologies is this company that wants to put magnesium hydroxide in St Ives Bay to trap carbon um, and save the planet. Um, there's a big debate to be had there. Marine coastal sustainability that Rachel and Tom work on, sustainable tourism, the list is endless. Um, so I suppose I'm kind of saying that there's loads of conversations we could be having and are having that we could think about more systematically in relation to knowledge through pragmatism. Um, and maybe the civic university agreement could be a vehicle to do that if we thought more creatively about that. Uh, Back to pragmatism, I think this is my last slide. Um, so Fly, I don't know if anyone's looked at that book by Flyberg about, uh, it's a really good book about case study research and he uses a lot of pragmatic ideas in there. He basically argues that this approach to rooting your knowledge production in place and problematic debates and discussions in communities can restore social science to its classic position as a practical, intellectual activity aimed at clarifying the problems, risks and possibilities we face as humans and societies and contributing to social and political practice. My question is, does, do you buy this or not? You know, how, what do you think? Uh, does it help us understand where we can go? That's what he puts it as, but pragmatists would say, you know, what's the cash value of these ideas? 
Does it help us think about our future? Does it help us make a better life for ourselves and our communities? What would it look like for our campus, democratic culture more widely? Um, and could we in Cornwall maybe use our campus as a way to model this new way of doing social science and then scale up through civic university agreement or just because we work well together uh, through a particular end. So that's the end of my rabbit. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dan. Really I'm just going to see um back onto teams here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, thank you. Oh, that was... I, didn't, I forgot to pass my other visual aid round, oh, which yeah. is Newlin Copper. Uh, in the 30s, the people of Newlin who were facing unemployment had, had an employment creation scheme where they were taught working people um, metalwork skills, and they used Cornish copper to make the most beautiful things. Uh, which is this is another family heirloom with a fish on it, which is a very classic newly design. Wonderful. And these things are now really expensive, so they've become very expensive. And again, it's a I kind of thought it was a good visual aid for thinking about place and the fact that we do things in a particular way that then has cash value for communities. And um, it's not just relying on the national government again, it's, it's which is what people do, they can claim that national government mm. rather than what we can do locally. Yeah. yeah. So I want to invite questions and have discussion now, really. I just wanted to say to the people online, um, if you'd like to speak, we can turn the audio on and you can speak or you can type into the chat and I can read your question out for the rest of the room. So we can do it either way. I'm just going to put the volume back up on our speakers in the room. So that if um, so, if, you, if you're online and you'd like to speak and if you indicate in the chat uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll invite you to speak when it's your time. Um, so. Um, who would like to react first? Um, maybe I'll just do, say one thing because I, I think this, as I under, as I listened to your presentation, it seemed to me there were three things. There was a provocation for us here at this university and this campus in terms of how things could be managed and organised. Um, then there was the kind of big piece, which was the sort of philosophical, epistemological. Um, how does that translate into research question? And then there was the case studies of Cornwall, where, where you've been involved in things. And so I think there might be interesting feedback. Uh, there, um, somebody online, you've got Joni. your mic. Uh, Joni, you've got your microphone on. If you don't mind muting, that would, uh, that would be great. Perhaps you've done it great, thank you. Um, so yeah, there, there was our research here uh, in terms of um, what you've been doing and other research that people might be involved in. So I think we could talk about any of those um, and obviously linking them would be great. We particularly want to make sure we've got time for that core epistemological methodological question. Um, but if people have got comments about the particular research that's been done here, that would also that would also be great. Um, so I'm going to sit down and, and see um, who would like to comment or ask a question. And I'm going to be checking the chat on here as well, to, in case people online want to ask something as well. We've got a question right at the back. Hi, um, thanks, Jane, really interesting. I, it's, it's quite interesting to hear this. Maybe this is part one and two that you, you, you summarized there. I'm not sure which, which, which part it, 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 it aligns best with. But, you know, this tension between doing world hitting research that gets cited and read by 100 people and uh, and generates huge impact and then the university loves you for it but it actually doesn't really do much because people then read it and think well that's great but how does it apply in this context and, and I, how can I do anything with it and on the other hand there's these there's research which is social science token social scientist which is we're thinking of these great things uh, we want to do them but oh to do it well let's just bring in a social scientist to sort of assess what the impacts are going to be and I just think, and I, and I know you don't think this, but but just the way you are, and, and there's nothing wrong to think this, but the way you're, you're speaking sometimes, I think that it feels to me that social science might just be reduced to consultancy. And actually we know everything we need to know about social sciences. And all we really need to do is just measure the social impact, get all the views, summarize all the views and be pragmatic about what's a compromise that we can. And in which case my job's not necessarily important because I think 
you know, I could have maybe done that without years and years of study. I mean, bringing in views and trying to reach compromises are incredibly important. And I'm sort of finding that in terms of impact as well. So I guess my question is, to what extent do you think social science is still key? Or do you think more social science consultancy that's place-based is more important and actually less of the sort of abstract theoretical thinking? It'd be interesting to see if anyone else has gotten on to that. But I actually think we should be able to do the place-based work that's really hard-hitting and more hard-hitting than a lot of other social science if we do it well. That's what I'm trying to advocate for. I mean, I agree that there's a tendency to just say, oh, we're just about kind of consultation, making sure that we can, can consult with everybody in the community. But if we do this properly, we should be raising new questions that we ground in action research, say, or experiment or conversation in a place that then do scale up or travel anyway. Scale up's not a great word, but travel to other places. Uh, and an example of that is this debate about progress. So say we want to take on big P progress, we could do it through some grounded research in a place like Cornwall, but then take on the big philosophical questions in the wider academic community. And I know it's not easy to do because it's kind of two diff really different skill sets. One is the philosophical, the big picture, understanding what's in all the other journals and all the other disciplines and then the other one is much more hands-on and maybe we need to have a division of labor a bit more about that and pool our resources but we should be able to do both i think uh, so for instance that work on asset transfer that although it looks quite parochial it's about falmouth town council taking over a swimming pool or a library the issues that it raises if you write them in a certain way can scale up to local government in general or relationships between citizens and state. So we can still pitch it in the, the big picture while also being really grounded and practical. Not that it's easy. Um, I think we've got Matthew up here who uh, looks like he wants to ask a question. So go ahead, Matthew, if you unmute yourself, we should be able to hear you. Uh, thank you very much, Jane. That was a brilliant uh, deck. I couldn't hear who asked that question before, um, was it Peter? Tom. Sorry, I can't hear. It was Tom. Tom. Well, I, I thought he was on the money. That was very good. Um, I, can't, um, I suppose playing devil's advocate as somebody, I mean, I, um, I'm at the sharp end of a couple of these current transactions that you've had on your slides, as you know, so I'm involved in the growing schemes work. I'm involved in helping Falmouth Town Council take on the Leisure Centre, which Cornwall Council closed. <clears throat> uh, I think your core premise of um, the role of pragmatism is fundamentally correct. I'd agree with that. And I think what, but what we're finding is that uh, community activists are becoming pra pragmat pragmatists or are pragmatists, dealing with the actual risk, holding the risk, not trying to manage it out of existence. They've been very pragmatic about what's involved in making stuff work but that the um, larger scale governance mechanisms are failing to be pragmatic and are incapable now of dealing with the things that they are, they extract tax to allegedly pay for. And that dysfunction is to do with the response to complexity because the bureaucratic response to complexity is to complicate things, whereas the community response to complexity is to deal with it and even to celebrate it. Um, I think the uh, the way Cornwall Council is using the donut, it's early days, but um, I think, you know, my jury is firmly out because it hasn't stopped it doing harmful things. Um, <clears throat> uh, has it encouraged it to do good things? Um, not sure. I think the One Planet DPD will be a great example to, to study closely how that evolves. And, and it'd be great to see a comparative study between how given that it's got the same author as the Wales One Planet DPD, James Shorten, the planner, wrote the way the, um, the, you know, the, the same, the DPDs for both Wales and for Cornwall. It'll be really interesting to see if it gets interpreted any differently in Cornwall. Um, in Wales, one of the biggest critiques, as you'll know, is that um, it, it's there's been a middle class barrier put up to stop growers living on their own land where they grow in cultivation. In Cornwall, the, the level of support that's building for community growing schemes could enable 
um, a bit of a twin achievement of sorting out some housing crisis while sorting out community growing uh, opportunities. You know, that could happen all, all in one thing. So it'd be great to see if that happens. But that would require a level of pragmatism. And my, my final little part of this, and I'm not sure if it turns into a question, but it could, which is that, yes, Falmouth Town Council has led the way in, in, in radical pragmatism, let's call it that, saying, look, this town cannot afford to lose these assets, therefore we will step into the breach and do them. But it's had literally bugger all support from anybody really, a little bit from the LGA. But in terms of, um, I mean, the town clerk of Falmouth Town Council is effectively a chief executive, but he's operating within governance, municipal governance frameworks from the last century. And frankly, with members uh, who are not equipped to support him in dealing with the risks, the risk profiles that he's taking on. So you're relying an awful lot on goodwill, community goodwill, and Cornwall Council's not really helping them. Um, and indeed has gone out of his way to make things difficult for them with some of the stuff that's gone on with the swimming pool, as I, I know firsthand. So I think I wouldn't want to um, paint too rosy a vision uh, with some of those things you've re referenced. I think there's some small print which needs unpacking, but fundamentally I agree that there is, there is a pragmatism at work, but um, in the actualization of that pragmatism we are letting uh, the political leadership off and what we need is some radical pragmatism in the political leadership uh, as well thank you yeah i mean hard to disagree with anything you said there matthew but and i wasn't trying to say that these experiments or conversations have solved anything I was just kind of pointing to the fact that if you do open yourself, I mean, it's really about being a geographer in some ways. It's about field work. If you go into a field, you open yourself up to the provocations of the field. And when you come to Cornwall, you're embedded in these conversations. And this, these are the kind of things that take that you start to take up. That's what I'm trying to make the point. Not that the, the donut is changing anything very much or... And actual fact that the town councils, I thought when I met them, I was blown away by what they were taking on with nobody paying any attention or celebrating them or, or discussing it. So um, some of them are working better than others. And I thought the town and parish councils have done amazing stuff. But you are right that in many ways in our society, what the problems are is all our big institutions are failing us. Uh, and when things go wrong, they make them more, I mean, the university is a classic case, the university makes everything more complicated. Rather than simplifying it, we make everything unbelievably more complex and more problematic and, and it fails a lot of the time. And this is happening in our police, we saw it last week, we've seen it in local government, we've got this ridiculous debate going on around devolution where we're not having a proper debate. Um, so. Yeah, I'm not trying to say that anything's working very well, but I'm saying that grounded local interventions could actually help us sort some of those things out. We need a different way of doing so many things uh, and we should maybe spend more of our time thinking about what's going on on our doorstep and what conversations and experiments we can have so that we can help reform some of these things. I mean, I'm not saying we can take wrong because it feels really to me anyway it feels quite overwhelming the nhs look at it it's a basket case um can i bring BBC, something in? i mean all these institutions are in a really bad way so can i bring in a comment from uh joni who, who's put something on the chat so uh, joni who's a co-director of the institute of cornish studies so joni's message was uh, thanks for this jane uh, it's great Totally agree about the pragmatism and the importance of figuring out practical and innovative solutions that work on the ground. Um, I was wondering about your thoughts about connecting all of these separate parts into a whole system approach. And we, we talked a little bit about um, systems approaches in the previous seminar, um, where we were looking at more specifically on complexity theory. Um, uh, uh, this whole system, sorry, Matthew, do you mind muting your microphone? We're hearing you tapping. Um, uh, so the um, so so those, those go into a whole system approach which connects up the various different elements. So in the system of Cornwall, for example, to ensure that the questions we're addressing are addressing the whole social and ecological ecosystem of Cornwall. So it, to what extent do you think that that because I was wondering about that when when Matthew was talking, he's sort of explaining this complexity of the problem. 
a sort of systems approach is a way of trying to sort of take that all together. Does that fit with what you're trying to do? Does, is that overcomplicating it from your point of view? Uh, I don't know. Maybe someone else should try because I've never really thought about systems theory properly. Um, it does make it very complicated, though, because mm. everything is connected to everything else and scale comes into place. So some things are driven by very non-local processes and others are more local. So. Mm. Um, well, I, need to, I need to read Joni's book properly because yeah. obviously she's in favour of adaptive, complex adaptive yeah. systems. So maybe she'll talk about that applied to Cornwall in her seminar. But it's been quite popular in recent years to say everything's a system. But I'm not sure how it really helps us. Um, OK, because you sure. don't think it gives you an analytical purchase? Is that the problem? Or it's, or it's actually reducing the specificity of individual things you want to look at well you get you have a kind of entry point to complexity don't you when when you're a social science you have one window or one entry point say asset transfer and it then ex opens up a whole load of other questions that always happens in research um but you're still you still have to go in somewhere mm. um i know amanda brookman's really we met matthew knows about this but Manda's very keen on, on systems, but it can feel a bit overwhelming as well if you have to tackle everything. Whereas just tackling one thing properly, like Rachel and I did that Civic Lantern event, it was a big job organising one event and then following it up to make the community growing spaces actually happen is another absolutely monumental thing which has gone on for a whole year. Matthew's involved and we've got loads of people having discussions. It's really productive, but it's that in, on its own is a huge thing. Mm. Um, Let me come back my... to Matthew and then we'll see if there's other questions in the room. Thank you. I was just going to pick up on the systems point. I think Jane's absolutely right that um, without the right safeguards in place, it can be utterly overwhelming to um, to, to try and look at everything um, at, at any scale, actually, but even at the very local scale. If, if I've just come from a Pendennis Leisure Board meeting now up in the old ships and castles, you know, which we're trying to open with the target date 20th of May. You know, if you if you think about everything we're doing, it is overwhelming. But the advantage of the systems approach is that you don't draw artificial edges, you don't exclude possibilities. So it's a it's a it's a form of abundance thinking that then brings forward potential solutions that wouldn't otherwise feature if you were looking through your particular lens framed around <clears throat> the particular strand you know it's it's hilarious to me that the asset transfer <laughs> in question well one it wasn't on offer right let's remember we had to fight for the right to have this asset transferred and we had to make threats and could do all sorts of chicanery to get it um uh, a possibility and then there was the politics of that local and cornwall wide then we got the asset transfer on offer and now we're in protracted negotiations between three parties to secure an asset transfer um and it's um it's an opaque process and like i say family town council's been given next to no support by anybody to to achieve that and there's just this expectation that it's all going to be fine so um but i think um yeah sorry so that that's just a, again another um, mildly cynical comment about the act actualities of the process um perhaps the social scientist's role in that is to is to hold the lens up and just to be able to gently say or be in a critical friend space to the to the institution that is Cornwall Council look actually just yes it's happening um, and partly because of things you're doing but quite often in spite of things you're doing um, and so there's that system thing again around not having artificial edges. Yeah I used to teach um, community organising and when we looked at living wage conversations you'd often find that there'd be this middle management there in every organisation that say no to everything and block everything. And the Cornwall Council is very like that with devolution. There'll be people in the middle in the legal team or the devo team or something that are really, the university's too slow and complicated. And the teaching community organising was to say, go to the top and shift the board member who then would make things happen in the, in the body of the organisation. And maybe there's something in that as well, having strategies for overcoming the complexity and the barriers, um, which again is a kind of practical intervention that might help. Mm. Are there other questions in the room here that we can bring in? Rachel had her hand. 
Well, I was just going to add to the, the systems question, I think, because I think we kind of came up against that a little when we were working with Cornwall Council around the donor economics idea. And I agree, it's, it's totally overwhelming. <laughs> but I think um, in some ways, I, I mean, I totally agree with Musky, there's absolutely no evidence, as far as I can see, that donors have made any difference whatsoever. But, but I would love to be in a room <laughs> with the people who are using it in terms of using the decision-making framework or the you know, decision wheel to see if it is shifting how they are talking or thinking about some of those things. Because I think, you know, just an experience that we had in working with the individual people in the council, um, you know, that there is an exchange of ideas about, you know, how we think about that complexity and how you do take account of different dimensions of things when you're making a decision. Um, but I think the critical thing is that thinking about a system in a very open sense as everything is interconnected and very complicated isn't necessarily very helpful, but but having some direction around, you know, what's the the minimum that we're kind of willing to accept in this area or what's our priority in terms of improving X, Y, Z and how how then do we like think about that within the systems framework can be quite helpful. So I think that that was our, our learning from the donut experience. Maybe. Yeah. And one of the things about something like the donut is that it's it's a global network. So you're sharing ideas across. You can suddenly connect. So it's a bit like Matthew's saying that it makes you think differently if you're aware of these connections. So all of a sudden, Cornwall is on the map in terms of other places like Amsterdam that's experimenting. And, and this morning, there was an event on the biosphere idea that Tiago from Law had organised and Martin Alvey from the cabinet, Cornwall Council cabinet went to speak about nature recovery strategies. And he was then suddenly in a dialogue with people from Costa Rica and Norway who've got UNESCO biosphere designations and it suddenly opens up another conversation so in a way that's another thing that comes from these kinds of connections widening the conversation and sharing learning across space mm. so Joni's replied again um Joni, i don't know if you actually want to unmute and put your video on and speak um but if i, I just put that in the chat but i haven't heard back so I, i'll read her comment out but turn your video on and just interrupt me Joni, if you want to um, so Joni's saying, I suppose from one of the things that I'm thinking a lot about uh, is housing. Oh, here you are. Hey. You need to unmute, Joni, and then we can hear you. Yeah, I'm also not entirely certain about my Wi-Fi, so it might all go wrong. But yeah, so I was just thinking, so, um, and I think this is one of the things that I'm coming up, that I'm seeing quite a lot over here in the US. I'm outside, as you can see, it's a bit cold. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking a lot about in the US is well, things like housing, for example, which is a also a huge issue in in um, Southwest Virginia, which is where I'm where I'm, I'm based. Um, you know, for a lot of very similar kinds of reasons to the, what we have in Cornwall and in and particularly in other rural areas in um, in the UK as well. But, I'm, and, but one of the things that kind of like really strikes me is that actually about how that's really quite central to the problem. And and this is one of the things that I like about a systems approach is that kind of like you're thinking about where where the bits are within the, the wider system that gives us energy or that help to enable us to do things and where the bits are in the system that actually mean that actually kind of like drains um, a space of energy um, and drains community capacity and people's ability to be able to kind of like to, to do this kind of like this pragmatic um, uh, organising that you're talking about, which I completely wholeheartedly agree with. And I'm just thinking with regards to Cornwall, you know, already like listening to Matthew, you know, Matthew's talking about some of those spaces that are kind of like sucking energy away you know, that are based that are kind of you know to do with institutions and the way institutions are working and it would be really interesting to learn a lot more about the community organizing work that you've been doing as well jane or that you've done in the past you know um, uh, sort of previous to this and some of the solutions that you're coming with so i'm sort of thinking sort of using the systems approach to think about what is draining the draining communities of energy to, be able to do stuff and what is kind of like creating that energy to be able to do things and like I, I keep coming back to housing as being one of those things that actually is really quite central but unless we deal with it we're actually just kind of like you know um uh it's sort of just like sucking 
a lot of community capacity out of the way because people are just like literally trying to survive. But anyway, that's me. Do you want to respond to that? Um, not especially. I mean, sure. Jamie's right there. You can really see where energy's something's positive and then something's negative, and it makes a massive difference. We probably don't ever think about that enough. The kind of emotional energy of what we do. Mm. It'd be quite something to think about, isn't it? About our own labour time, what we spend our time doing, and where we are emotionally enriched by what we do and a lot of the time that's not happening and we don't really tackle that so that's the thing about teaching all the endless emails and all the silly queries that you get and it's really draining and really tiring and it's not an emotionally positive thing so we need to reflect more on our own practices to break well i guess i had a question that was related to that which is i think that the the more place-based research that I've been doing in Cornwall has often led to that sort of situation where you're working with really positive, really proactive people on the ground in Cornwall, but you're in this multi-level governance system where you end up as a researcher coming up against the same barriers as you know the people you're working with, um, and in these kind of multi-level governance structures, you know, as if you're doing pragmatic local research, what I mean, I don't know much about pragmatic systems, so this is really a question, Jane, but you know, how does how do you engage with higher level governance structures or you know the wider constraints that might be shaping that from a pragmatic research perspective? Uh, and in many ways, one of the big barriers to what I've been talking about is the university because we're not very well set up to do this and we've been talking about things like a civic university agreement and then nothing really happens there's no resource for it there's no we're not given any time to do it there's no clear strategy to make it happen so a lot of those barriers are internal to us in our own institution um and then you're right extra when you think about Cornwall civil society is incredibly vibrant with so much energy and so many good ideas there's it's really powerful, um, but somehow it gets stuck there and we don't do enough to, do it, which is, I suppose, Joni's point, we don't do enough to join up the, the islands of energy to make things happen. Um, so I'm, I've probably not got an answer for it, except that organising does work. That was my experience in the living wage campaign when it started and you have to have a really long-term fact vision for it but when it started everyone said it was mad it would never happen that was in 2001 and then there was a kind of step-by-step -step approach knocking off the kind of easy targets and making a sector strategy so that you go for one of the big banks at canary wharf and once one signed up you'd be able to get others because everybody's competing so once one university signed up other universities took it more seriously um, and you can get through those things but you have to have a really long-term concerted effort around one one or two things and that's where I have a problem with the systems thing I suppose that it over we don't want to over complicate things in many ways we need to simplify them so that we can actually try and get something done because we're really good at talking but we're not very good at doing anything um, and that's striking about the Civic Lantern. So we came up with that idea, which sounds really simple. We want to support every community in Cornwall that wants one to have a community agriculture scheme, which has so many, everyone knows all the benefits of it. It builds community, it builds good food, you can connect the kids, you can do something good for biodiversity. But making it happen is really difficult. And we don't pay much attention to that. So the academic literature is not really focused on delivery. And it's all very high polluting and big ideas. And somehow we need to try and do both. I'm not saying we don't need bigger ideas. Ideas are everything. If we have the right ideas, we can do amazing things. But we need somehow to do both. Um, I don't Matthew, think making it happen I mean, is really difficult. I, I think that um, the act of growing itself is undervalued in society. And nobody makes money from growing. And so this space is opening up where it's a little bit decorative and hobbyist and and peripheral. Um, but we know we're sowing the seeds for something big for the future resilience of our communities. But I think the actual practical activities, we're pushing it open doors. But the thing is about organising to push through them and then making sure that we've got the right support. But, you know, I only got involved in um, in November 
and it feels like the level of consensus that's building uh, across Cornwall in favour of making a radical step change in the amount of community growing that's going on, it just feels like massive open doors. And I think by June, when the leadership board sort of adopts our recommendations, I think we will we will find resources unlocking and flowing quite quickly soon after through share prosperity and community infrastructure levy and other resources. And then what will matter is how exactly communities do self-organise to use adaptive uh, complexity, adaptive systems uh, piece, or how they are organised to use the kind of uh, perhaps the pragmatism. But that, that's where the gap will be. And that comes back to like what Luke Barclay's talking about with anchor organisations and metapopulation. Anyway, sorry, I've jumped in uh, very rudely, apology. I think what's interesting about that is that um, there's the, the, the key thing you're saying, Jane, is that academic research should be thinking about how you do delivery. So, I mean, what Matthew's expressing there is some of the interesting complexities of how easy or difficult is it to deliver in certain contexts. I think the bigger point you're making is academic research should think about delivery, and that's not normally what academic research thinks about. It normally thinks about the idea. And then somebody else has to yeah. deal with how to deliver. Is that have I understood yeah, that right? That's true. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it properly before, but yeah. Because um, because I, I find that really interesting from a um, political point of view in terms of the idea of pragmatism. Because um, if we take British politics over the last few years, you've got figures like, for example, Jeremy Corbyn on the left, someone like Boris Johnson on the right. Both have been described as sort of in some level populist or in some level ideological, you know, whatever, however you want to get into that. The pragmatists um, have always been associated, in my, in my understanding, with the technocrats. Right? So the pragmatists are like the centrists who, uh, you know, don't want to be too ideological. They're the ones that want to take a practical approach to fixing the problem. And what you're saying is from a politics point of view, Pragmatism is not the same as technocracy. Technocracy actually uh, wipes out the capacity of, you know, everyday people to actually get involved in solving their own problems. But I don't think you're advocating a going to a, no. you're not going to an ideological edge. You're you're, you're saying that there's a, a sort of radical devolution of power. I think in, involved yeah. in that philosophy is that is that right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Gordon Brown was the classic case where I had a bit of a light bulb moment with Gordon Brown because, and it goes back to this big P progress thing. You know, it's very well intentioned, big vision, big plan. And it's all about doing things to people. You know, having targets from Whitehall and everybody mm -hmm. in the local government or the NHS or the police have to do certain things. And it's this control freakery, which really goes through the left big time. And when you look at the origin of the NHS, um, Nive Evan was, you know, he's a champion for doing it, but he really wanted to control everything from, from Whitehall. And it's a very debilitating vision of citizenship that overwrites everything that came before, which was much more organic and self-organised and parochial in a positive way, parish and, and in terms of its roots in, in the parish and self-organisation. Um, so, yeah, I'm not advocating for a kind of technocracy at all, but pragmatism has a dirty, dirty, um, is a bit of a dirty word because it implies that you're going to compromise at the first hurdle and that you're not a serious politician, um, which is a bit of a problem for the tradition of pragmatism because mm. in many ways it's profoundly radical because you are committed to this practical outcome. Uh, which is not what politicians, politicians stand on stages and pontificate, like Jeremy Corbyn, love, you know, great big vision. Um, it's not about doing very much. Um, for Boris Johnson is to say, you know, that's what politicians do. So can I ask so, you about that so a bit So I suppose my other book, actually, before this one, was on localism, and that's no coincidence, because I really, really believe in devolving power to the lowest. Subsidiarity is a trendy word for it, but devolving power to the mm. as possible therefore, and letting people make their own decisions and everyone says that's a postcode lottery which is which is not what sort of state services should be but i think that would be a lot better and then people would have to organize around their own interests and their own visions rather than having whitehall determine everything which is a disaster our institutions are, are, are a disaster so that's really interesting because you're so because that is the comeback, isn't it? It ends up as a postcode lottery, and you're saying that's preferable I, to I think so. over centralised. I know I'm a very minority view on that. I know it's and really that's interesting. What everyone says to me, but I do think it would be better. We would, you know, it would be different. 
but it would be better. Mm. For people, it would be, for ordinary people, it would be better. But Do other people have reactions on that? Once they win the lottery. Well, you still have to, you could still distribute national wealth through taxation to local bodies that made their own decisions. So I'm not saying you don't have national redistribution of wealth, I think you do, but you then devolve power and money to communities at various scales to make decisions on their own terms. Mm. Mm. So I'm aware that our time is running out. I just want to come back with one other critique of this um, so that we've... There was another oh, there's there. another there's yeah. a question. No, go yeah, ahead. I think you also had your hand It's up. OK, go. Are you fine. sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you had your hand up quite long before. Well, I think oh. you would take it off on another time. So go. Okay. Go. <laughs> well, the, I will keep very short. Maybe there will be time for two short ones. Um, I'm just keep on wondering, I'm on board in the minority view that we should decentralize power as far as possible and give power back on local levels. But at the same time, we're also dealing with a globalized nature of capital. And that makes things very complicated. Um, yeah, I actually just want to leave it there. Yeah. No, you're right. Well, but what, what do you think is the solution to that? I think maybe we need to think deeper about the connection between the global and the local and how how the local activism and local problem solving how we we can find ways for that to feed back into global um policy making because um, we need to think about supply chain about power we probably all wear clothes that are not made here in cornwall so it's it's good to be place-based and think um what's happening here but we shouldn't lose the connection with other places that we have through consumption, capital, and capitalism. Yeah, which are more powerful than ever. So I realise this is <laughs> this is a long way from the world we're in. Um, yeah, I mean those global supply chains are incredibly powerful, and the big businesses. And there was a woman in here last week from Cap Gemini, one of the big management consultants. Were you in here? Yeah, I was there. I found it kind of terrifying. Mm -hmm because they're selling their services to these big multinational companies and it's just another market to them. The green future is just another market. It's, and what I find it's another way of power being up there, not yeah. down here. It's what I found disturbing is this kind of the elite people deciding what's good for everyone else. Um, yeah, and I don't think that's going to go. Forum. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's very troubling, but it's not going to be easy to have the answers. And in many ways, I think politics will kind of take over because people really will resent. People do not want to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. I think the methodological, because that was similar to my comment, the, the methodological issue related to place-based research is to do with the fact that place is relativised in a globalised society. So, I, I mean, I'm involved in place-based research, so I'm committed, yeah. but the space and time is not what it was, and uh, and and that's I think a methodological question we have to figure out. Um, even if we get really grounded and local, we cannot escape being connected to what's happening in multiple other places at, at the same time elsewhere that's affecting our present. Uh, that feels yeah. like a really challenging component to this. Yeah, I don't know if you've come across that debate about being local. Yeah. So that everything is local but simultaneously global and multi-scalar and so there is a lot of discussion about those kind of things that helps um, but in a way we need to fight for place being important so Gibson Graham I don't know if you've looked at their work they've kind of make a really important political point about place and not assuming that you can subsume it in space and mm. the non-local and um, yeah should we come to this other question you had yeah, well, I suppose I'm just thinking about pragmatism and where it sits in relation to um, process and outputs and outcomes. And with your idea about stuff traveling, whether it's actually the processes of going through that that travel and not necessarily what sometimes people conflate outputs and outcomes and actually a lot of the outcomes are in that process and that's what travels rather than the deliverables or do you see what yeah, I, I mean yeah. but I, I know pragmatism is very much in terms of giving the tools to deliver but 
it feels like there's more than that. Yeah, there is. And actually, when I was at Queen Mary, we wrote a paper on process pragmatism. That's what we called it. Because the idea was that if you take this approach to epistemology, you have it's a process that you're going through, which has loads of other unintended or maybe intended, mm. but consequences for things like citizenship. So if you're if you're taking social inquiry seriously, then everybody in the room would somehow, or that's the thing about the Isles of City Community Research Network. That's the kind of thinking behind it, that you're giving money to a, a network of community organisations to decide what their research agenda is. And in that process, they're therefore learning about research skills, how their community functions, who's got political power, cit basic citizenship stuff. And John Dewey's work is really big on that because he was supporting a kind of democratic culture against the big business. So it's interesting, The Public and Its Problems is a really interesting book to look at. It's in the 1930s and he's really worrying about what happens to democratic culture when you get these big bureaucracies of the state and the market. What happens to civil society and ordinary citizens when you get that technocracy and that big corporate capital with more and more power? And since then, of course, it's escalated massively. And his argument was instead of the great society, we need the great community. So we need these islands of social capital, these spaces where citizens can come together on their own terms and share their own problems and come up with their own solutions. And that's what community organising comes out of exactly this tradition of, of philosophy, interestingly, um, in the Chicago School of Urban Sociology. Saul Alinsky, who's the kind of pioneer of community organising, was a PhD student at, at Chicago with all those philosophical traditions at the time, um, arguing that we needed to re retain this democratic culture in our cities, in our communities, against the might of the state and the market. And what community organising does, it says you, you want to organise civil society on its own terms to then do deals with the state and the market. So you're basically saying, if you want to come and do business in East London, we've got terms and we're organised. And so you get your organised people together in a room, a bit like we're doing with the community growing spaces, Matthew. We're getting the key stakeholders in the room who are saying, this is what we want, come and do business with us. Um, and civil society is always catching up with what the big guys are doing. So we have to be much more conscious of the kind of interventions we can make to build those platforms with civil society to make its own agenda, which is where localism comes in, because you have to do place based because that's where people live. That's where they work. That's when they're, they're invested. So if you get the schools and the communities and the churches and the trade union branches to work together in a place, you can try, try to make a difference to that. Yeah. So it's exactly about the process, mm -hmm. much more than that. Then one of the phrases was people before projects, mm -hmm. people, relational power before the project and the, and the deliverables. OK, we are out of time. Um, this has been brilliant, Jane. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined us online. Thank you for coming here. Um, the idea is that we continue some of the conversation uh, in an online space. Um, I'm figuring out the details of that, but I'll be in touch. I'll let you know. Um, and I'd love for you to, to continue this. And I think there are some really interesting crossover areas today that relate to the seminar we had in, in January that we could also explore in terms of how your sort of methodological assertions interact with what Malcolm would propose. And you're right that Joni will be uh, presenting our December seminar, talking about her work, which is more about the systems approach. Um, but before that, on the 4th of October, we'll have um, Professor Stefan Boehm uh, talking about um, complexity and evaluation. So that also relates to the idea of outcomes in um, relation uh, to process and, and methods. So I think there's a lot of interesting overlaps here, but thank you again, Jane. Round of applause. Really, really appreciate it. You should be doing more that. Well, maybe, maybe at one point. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank, and thanks to everyone online. Thanks so much for joining us.